guys. Happy Thursday. You are probably watching this because either you are not in class or I am not in class. Um, or you just wanted a little bit more information on indigenous American civilizations, which is also perfectly fine. So you guys should have an attached notes in your Google Classroom. It is the doc that says indigenous American civilizations guided notes. You are just going to be filling in the blanks with the orange words on the screen. Pretty straightforward, but you do have to sit down and listen to my whole spiel. So we're going to start here with this picture, actually. It is the chief mountain and is sacred to the Blackfoot, and it marks the boundary between the Blackfoot Reservation in Montana and Glacier National Park, which I think is pretty cool because the Blackfoot Nation is one of the biggest ones that we still know about today. And then here's some of the regions of the American Indian groups. So as you can see, they're separated uh, mostly by like climate and vegetation. So we have our subarctic and our arctic up here. Obviously, those are going to be very cold. The few tribes that do live in these areas are going to be very spread out. There's not going to be very many of them because uh, there's not a lot of resources in that area. Same with kind of this northwest coast. Very cold, but mostly fishing in this area. California and then like on the edge of the northeast southeast kind of areas but mostly in California we're going to see a lot of people um, using fishing as their main source of food and also a uh, little farming in those areas as well. Now the Plains Indians that's the ones we're going to be a little more familiar with and those are going to be mostly hunter gatherer types those are the ones you kind of think of with the teepees and the buffaloes. Then we have like our southwest and then also some of that Great Basin area is going to be mostly desert. So those people are probably going to be moving around a lot, but there are a couple farmers here and there. Northeast, southeast, mostly going to be like those fishing areas. Northeast is going to be very wooded. Some areas up here are also going to start farming and start larger civilizations. Down in the southeast, usually going to be very swampy, but they do like to use their boats to get around. And some, very, very few in this area are going to be farming. Eastern Woodlands people is the first people in your uh, notes. We are going to start with them. They lived in heavily forested areas between the Appalachians and the Atlantic. So on your notes, you need to write Appalachians and spell it correctly because it's right in front of you. Most tribes divided into village bands led by one chief and generally divided into northeastern and southeastern groups. The earliest known inhabitants of the eastern woodlands were the peoples of the Adena and Hopwell cultures who inhabited the Ohio and Mississippi River valleys between 800 BCE and 800 CE. So that's 1,000 years. You used to think of BCE as BC, like before Christ. Now it's BCE before current era. And then current era is what you normally think of as AD. Okay, but now it's just current era. Same time frame, so. They had a tradition of building massive earthwork mounds. The eastern woodlands extended roughly from the Atlantic Ocean to the eastern Great Plains and from the Great Lakes region to the Gulf of Mexico. The indigenous peoples of the eastern woodlands spoke languages belonging to several language groups, like the Iroquoian, Muscogean, and Soyan, as well as apparently isolated language, such as the Natchez, Tamuka, Tanika, and the Yuchi. Many of these languages are still spoken today. So at this point, if you need to pause this to take uh, to finish this up, feel free to. But we are going to go on to our next slide. And now we are at the Northeastern Native Americans. So the two major languages in this group are going to be the Iroquois and the Algonquians. The Iroquois lived in large multifamily longhouses. And the Mohawk, on Onodaga, Anoida, uh, Cayuga and Seneca tribes formed a confederacy. So basically, they said we are going to come together and we are going to create kind of a union or kind of a government system and we are going to work as one in a government sense. Also known as the Haudenosaunee, people of the Longhouse. I apologize for all these mispronunciations. I am trying my best. They also had a matrilineal kinship, which means the inheritance was passed through the mother's line, meaning you identified with whoever your mother identified with. The Iroquois League was created to preserve peace between member nations and to protect them against outsiders. Great Council resolved differences and kept the peace. 
Individual tribes maintain their sovereignty. There was a bicameral two-house legislator like the U.S. Congress, so they have the House and the Senate in our U.S. Congress. And they did have re representatives. This all lasts at least to 1590 is when we know that that at least started. All right, on to our next one. Again, if you need to pause, feel free. The Northeastern tribes, we have the Algonquians who lived in oval wigwams, which you can see in the picture, and subsided by hunting and fishing. The tribes included the Delaware, Picot, Narragansett, and the Wampanoag. These patrilineal clans had names associated with their animal totems. Patrilineal means they followed the name of their father. Algonquians also included the Powhatan, Miami, and the Lenape. Lin uh, Although these tribes have great differences, they are linked linguistically, meaning they all speak the Algonquian language. They were the first group to encounter the English. And then in the picture, again, you can see what those kind of houses looked like. Again, pause as needed. This is just a picture of kind of where those northeastern tribes were. You might recognize some names like the Cree up here more in Canada. The Miami, Illinois, that's where we get the name for Illinois. Potawatomi here, Arapaho, Cheyenne, Blackfoot near Montana. So again, lots and lots of ones you might know. Oh, there's Delaware over here. That's where we get the name for the Delaware State. Let's move on to the southeastern tribes. They had structured governments with tribes broken into separate clans. Most lived in permanent homes, meaning they didn't move around, they were sedentary. Hunters and farmers of corn, beans, and pumpkins, those are going to be our three sisters. And they included the Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw Creek, Natchez, and Seminole, which you've probably heard a little bit about so far. The clans were related people. When a baby was born here, she belonged to that mother's clan, so again, follows the mother. Laws varied, but some laws were the same in all tribes. One such law is that you could not marry someone from your own clan. So you actually had to go marry someone from a different clan. Eventually, Europeans would describe these Native Americans as the five civilized tribes because they saw them as civilized for the modern age. Cherokee called themselves the principal people. They also had a traditional dance with masks performed at nighttime around a campfire. These male dancers with colorful masks represented evil spirits. It was supposed to protect against those evil spirits, kind of like what we do at Halloween. In 1821, a Cherokee named Sequoia, you might recognize that name, created a Cherokee syllabary, making the reading and writing in Cherokee possible, which was one of the first nations to do so. Uh, the Seminole lived in thatched roof houses known as, known as Chickies, and Creek towns were grouped into white and red categories set apart for peace and war. So if you were someone that was in charge of making sure the peace stayed, then you were in the peace section. If you were someone that was like a warrior, you would be in the war area. This next one is a picture of a group of young men from the Seminole tribe. And now we're on to the southwest. So in the southwest, we have the Hohokans that built 500 miles of irrigation canals and adobe buildings from 300 to 1500 CE. The ancestral Pueblans had uh, hundreds of communities that built dwellings and cliffs. And the Hopi, Acoma, and Zuni people are all Puebloans. The Magolan are related to the Acoma, Hopi, and Zuni people. The Puebloans share a common agricultural material and religious practices. Pueblo means village in Spanish, and it was used to refer to the people's style of dwelling. This area is called Cliff Palace. It was uh, the largest cliff dwelling in North America that we have found so far. You can see the top of the cliff kind of up here and how the city is sort of built into it. If you want to pause and read a little bit about it, go ahead, but we do not have the time on this video to do so. And then we have the Southwest Tribes. So in the Southwest Tribe, we have the Apache and the Navajo, both migrating to the area between 1200 and 1500. Navajo is also one of the biggest um, Native American tribes still in existence today. The Apache fought the invading Spanish and Mexican peoples for centuries. And their Eastern and Western Apache both divided into many tribes. The term Navajo actually comes from Spanish missionaries who refer to the Pueblo Indians through this term. 
Although they refer to themselves as the Dine, meaning the people, the Navajo and Apache are different, distant cousins, both with languages similar and both migrated from the northwestern Canada and Alaska. Until con con contact sorry, with the Pueblo and Spanish people, the Navajo were actually largely hunters and gatherers, and the tribe adopted farming techniques from the Pueblo, growing the tradition of growing those three sisters that we talked about earlier, which is beans, squash, and corn. Traditional Navajo society was organized through matrilineal kinship, so small bands of related kin made the decisions on a consensus basis, and the women were who you followed your lineage through. This next photo shows uh, some of Kome runners from the Navajo tribe. And then we've got the Mississippians. So the Mississippians lived in humid, temperate areas around the Mississippi River. They built large towns around a central plaza. The Chahokia was the largest city with a population of 10,000 to 40,000. And fighting and over farming is likely what forced them to move south. The Chahokia reached its peak around the year 1100, but residents did end up abandoning the city over the next centuries. It's likely because of environmental crisis. So there was probably too much farming going on in those areas, but the land eventually was not uh, resourceful enough, did not pr produce those minerals uh, that the plants needed anymore, and they would have to move on to different areas. This next one I think is pretty cool. You can pause to read if you would like, but these were just kind of monk mounds that were the largest pre-Columbian earth work built between 900 and 955 CE. These are the mounds in Illinois. The mound size was calculated to be about 100 feet high and 955 feet long, 775 feet wide. Uh, this makes it roughly the same size as the base of the Great Pyramid of Giza, so these were very intelligently and well-structured and well-built platform mounds. That takes us to our Great Plains Indians. Some of these you guys are going to be a little more familiar with. Um, so we have the immense and arid grassland with little rain making farming difficult. So most tribes are going to rely on hunting buffalo because they're nomadic. So they live in these teepees to allow for this nomadic life to move around to move with their food. Tribes include the Great Sioux Nation, Blackfoot, Arapaho, Cheyenne, Hidasta, and Plains Apache. Plains tribes are divided into two groups, which do overlap. The first were fully nomadic during the 18th and 19th century, following the herds of buffalo, and included the Blackfoot, Arapaho, uh, Cheyenne, Comanche, Crow, and some of the other Apache and Cree. The second group were sedentary, meaning they stayed in one place, and in addition to hunting buffalo, they raised crops and actively traded with other tribes. Uh, this is going to be like the Iowa, the Osage, the Pawnee, the Wichita, the Dakota. You might recognize some of those names. Pause as needed. Our next one is the buffalo hunt, and I'd like to note that Native Americans didn't actually have horses until the Europeans came over and the Spanish brought horses with them. Next photo are teepees. It usually takes between about 20 to 30 buffalo hides to make a good teepee. This is going to be the inside of a hut. This is a Blackfoot mounted warrior. And that takes us to our Great Basin Native Americans. We have them located between the Rocky Mountains and the Sierra Nevada. It includes the Shoshone and Paiute. They are nomadic with desert culture and mostly lived in peace um, in shared territories. Now we got one more slide to go through and I'm running out of time on my video. Pause as needed again. Okay, so now we have the California and Northwest Coast. So these guys are gonna live in a mild climate and abundant natural resources, hunting of salmon, our otters, seals, and whales. And because they had such an abundancy of this food, they were actually able to make things like totem poles and have a very rich culture. Tribes included the Salish, Chin Chinook, Nez Perce, Mojave, Yukoma, and Modoc. This next photo shows some Yukoma women dressed primarily um, in like the eastern Washington state. They, two of them are married. You can see by their feathers, one of them is not. And just to kind of go back here for a minute, since I do have a little bit of extra time, since they were able to have such a rich culture, they even had this thing of a gift-giving feast uh, where they involved giving away or destroying valuable items to demonstrate their wealth. Again, they have a very big connection 
uh, with the spiritual world, and I am running out of time, so please look at the slides if you have any other questions and turn on the guided notes.